We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're gonna have some real healing. We've gotta have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. And good morning, this is Dave Debo. On the program today, we look back just a little bit to the blizzard right around Christmas time. In Albany on January 21st, Governor Kathy Hochul singled out certain Western New Yorkers for all of their efforts to help other people during winter storm Elliott. And one of those that she recognized was Craig Elston. He's the owner of CNC Cuts on Fillmore Avenue. And during the blizzard, he kept his shop open. He put out the word that it was basically a warming center and sheltered at least 40 people from the cold. He's got a lot of things to talk about. Certainly that's a story that he can tell, but uh, he's got life advice. He'll talk about how it's important to be confident and stick to your goals. Much more to come in that regard coming up in the second half of the program. But first, Dawn Wells Clyburn is with us. She's the recently appointed executive director at Push Buffalo. That's People United for Sustainable Housing, Push Buffalo. And they're a group that not only lobbies for housing, but they actually operate a couple of housing units. And they're heavily involved in the discussion about climate change because they believe that this idea of sustainable housing is something that has to have some environmental justice as part of the component. So, Don, thanks very much for being here. Glad glad you're able to take some time with us this morning. Glad you're here. Thank you for having me. What do you picture right now is perhaps the number one housing issue in Buffalo? In terms of housing, I think the single most issue is more of the the intersectionality of it, you know, racism. We have a lot of people who are being displaced, and they're being displaced primarily in black and brown communities and working class communities, and the impact of that is always exaggerated in those areas. Um, And the need for affordable housing right now is just at critical mass. Give me an example. When you say it's exacerbated in those neighborhoods, how's that work? We like to compare. You know, we um, are located in West Buffalo, (laughs) the west side of Buffalo. And, you know, we often talk about the fact that, you know, you can fit three west sides um, on the east side of Buffalo, right? And when people refer to the east side of Buffalo, a lot of times they're referring about black and brown. Right. Black community, right? And so what we've seen is that the, you know, the reason why we have a a campaign right now, the Homes Guarantee, is because we are seeing uh, alarming rates of, of black and brown folks being displaced and going through the court system, especially after the pandemic and the lifting of some of those moratoriums. Oh, now, when you first mentioned it, I was thinking you were, you were talking about development, gentrification. You're talking about evictions, aren't you? I'm talking about evictions, but, you know, evictions are related to, like, the local economy. And, of course, development and displacing people is part of that. Gentrification is part of it. You know, when we talk about sustainable homes and push Buffalo and the work that it's doing, we don't just look at it from a, you know, a one-sided uh, perspective. We're looking at a whole ecosystem that is based on a really, really oppressive system and the justice aspect of it just doesn't touch on housing. Of course, when you touch on housing, then you have to wor- worry about the the quality of the housing, the indoor air quality, the safety, you know, safety in terms of what? It looks different for black people versus maybe for, you know, black and brown people or poor work- working class people than it might look for, you know, communities that have um, more access, right? And so we also look at things like the environmental justice perspectives of these things. We look at the intersectionality as a, you know, the code word, intersectionality, right? So we are looking at 
helping to model smaller scale solutions that can be scaled up. And the way that we do that is we look at developing affordable homes that are not just affordable, but they're also the greenest. They're the, you know, the best possible quality, not just contractor grade, that they fit in with the fabric of the existing architecture of the neighborhoods. Those things are really important to a general quality of life. When when you talk about homes and you talk about um, environment, you know, you have to think about, um, you know, how are people able to afford to live in their homes? What are the, you know, what are the subsidies that are available? What, what access to transportation to the jobs is available? And what is the future of the individual communities, then we built things like the Sustainable Workforce Training Center, which is scheduled to come online this spring, where people of and from the community will be um, learning about the trades that are really imminent, considering, you know, like the climate that we're in. So learning green technologies is important. So we're doing that as we're also like building uh, affordable housing, scattered site housing, um, different needs for different access points. That's the part of it that I think was interesting to me. I I would guess that my perception's typical, maybe not. I always thought of you guys as a an advocacy group. You actually operate some housing units. Yes, we are a membership based organization. And yes, you know, we we sit at, you know, we both, you know, imagine and conceive the thing and then we build the thing and then we lobby to make it something that can be scaled up and modeled in other communities and then ho- with the hope that the, it will become the norm and not the exception. Tell me more. What do your homes look like? How are they different? Uh, with our homes, we intentionally, um, number one, we set out to you know go through a, a really lengthy community engagement process that allows the input from uh, the people who live there, of and from the the community. We said we want we know what we need where we live, and we in, we intentionally seek out those voices so that the architecture of the community stays the same. And so a lot of times what you see is people move into the community and they might want to build out or rehab. It doesn't always fit in with that fabric of of the neighborhood. And we try to put in the the, uh, ground source heat heat pumps, air source heat pumps, metal roofs, wherever possible and as funding allows. Apart from that that physical construction, though, what of these makes it a model that is transplantable? Is it because of the ownership? Is it because you're a nonprofit? I think when push was started, we were, you know, really, really trying to stabilize a community that had been um, really left behind as many communities across the city and the and the country, for that matter, had been um, redlining and disinvestment was has been, you know, like a, a price that we have to pay. And I think as we were looking at vacant homes and, and, and vacant lots, it was a, a sense that we had to help get help stabilize the community and get community control of the resources and assets that were there, which was the abandoned homes, the housing stock. I think at this stage, what we're looking at is now really figuring out how we can turn those uh, community assets back over in a way that will really be meaningful to community members. And so looking at land trusts, looking at securing um, a home home ownership for the first time, we're going to have a home ownership program, but will help to build generational wealth. So these homes will be owner-held properties that they will also be able to lease out. Do you redevelop them and then hand them over to someone under some sort of sale agreement? We we could. We're we're exploring those opportunities with local partners, um, Heart of the City, the Buffalo Urban Renewal Agency, um, to see what's possible to braid funding sources. But definitely. And all along, the, the whole idea is that these homes will also be um, very green. You know, we're going to do sure. the same things that we would do. The standard is the same, whether it's rental or ownership. In order to solve this this problem, or at least to address the scope of it, do we need hundreds of more units? How big is the quote unquote housing problem in the city of Buffalo? The housing problem is as big as as many people that are waiting in court to be evicted. The housing problem is as big as as many people who are homeless um, and and don't have a stable place to live. The number is different for people who may have a a, a shelter. 
but it's not a long-term shelter. So couch that's surfing. pretty, yeah, couch yeah. surfing or living in shelters or just, you know, bouncing around. And so I think that number can be, you know, addressed in a, in a variety of ways, but we have a demand for it. We have a waiting list for our current units um, that's been over 600 plus. So just to give you an idea of the demand that we've seen is astronomical. And those numbers are from the end of last year. So I'm imagining that they've grown, especially when you consider the reduction of food stamp benefits and things Mm -hmm. like that, we're hearing a lot of cries about the escalating rents because of market, you know, the market rate rents and there's not enough affordable homes to go alongside that. And you also mentioned evictions. I know this is where we (laughs) move from the practical building of homes to some of the campaign and lobbying work you're doing. In the city of Buffalo, pushes pushing for, what is it called, the good cause eviction measure. Good cause eviction measure is absolutely necessary. So, you know, again, as we approach all of our projects, we don't approach it from one lens. We're looking at eco. If eco is home, then it's the holistic approach. And yes, um, we are part of, you know, that effort. We are doing building homes and um, lobbying for changes in law to catch up with what's needed, boots on the ground. There is a lot of work that's being done both at PUSH and we're really hopeful that the city of Buffalo has formed a, a, a housing task force um, that they've asked for different organizations and, and, and citizens to be a part of. And I'm hopeful that with that work that's being done, we will be able to um, champion the causes that we need here. Were it not for the weather, you would have been in Albany today as this program is. <laughs> that is absolutely right. Um, we were planning a trip and then, you know, a lot of snow fell in Albany and so here we are. What is this good cause eviction measure? What does it say? What what does it restrict a landlord from doing? Um, it restricts the landlord from being able to evict a tenant um, without good cause. I think that's it's, it's literally in the name. They have to have certain measures that Uh, before they are able to evict a tenant. And that just ensures equity. And and, and a landlord can't just throw out if they throw a person out if they have not addressed the repairs or updates and improvements in the homes. Like we've heard horror stories that people are living in substandard conditions, and yet the landlord is uh, pursuing rent and hasn't sought any remedy. What, What kind of behavior are you trying to stop? We're trying to keep people in their homes. And I think um, it's really important to remember that people who are, you know, struggling, there are people out there who are struggling, both on the tenant side and the landlord side. What we're trying to do is close that gap and, and make it so that folks can both stay in their homes and the landlords can get the support that they need. A lot of times we do hear about um Family, you know, families who own properties and they're struggling because they have a tenant that is not paying rent. And, of course, on the other side, we hear tenants that are struggling more frequently than not because they can't, you know, afford to stay and make the repairs, you know, wait for the repairs to be made. So there's many different scenarios, but... I appreciate what you said about the landlords also having problems. But I think as I look at this issue, I hear people saying that there's a lot of retribution and retaliation and those kind of things. Am Absolutely. I overstating the case? You're not overstating the case. We we field so many calls I can't even, you know, <laughs> respond. We have, you know, a tenant advocate that you know, takes on, takes intake and tries to refer out uh, for tenants who are having trouble to our legal partners. Um, But one story that really stood out to me was um, there was an apartment building and a woman, an elderly woman had been in the space and the I think this was the roof had caved in and there was leaking coming in and she was beginning to have breathing issues. And these are like Every day we're getting either emails, phone calls about people who have um, struggled. So, yeah, so much so that we had to create a hotline, you know, so we're in the process of creating a hotline to really be able to document and feel those calls to the proper people. I complained to my landlord about X or Y, and now suddenly I'm being evicted. Is that basically the story? That's pretty common. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How do you change that? What does this measure do? You know, basically, we're fighting for people who really need to 
be in their homes. They need the homes need to be healthy. They need to be warm. They need to be free of uh, toxins and indoor air pollutants. Um, and you know, with the Tenant Bill of Rights, we have a few points that we're trying to make with that. The right you know, to good cause eviction is one of them, which is basically a tenant protection. Right now, I think the that New York State law and in the city of Buffalo doesn't really completely insulate the tenant. It is more so in favor of the landlord. So the Tenant Bill of Rights, that's also including a right to timely repairs, um, right to language access. You know, we have um, a lot of folks who are newly immigrated to the city. You know, a lot of times people are kicked out because they just don't know what's going on. And so that's a problem. And then a right to know who owns the building. I have my own personal story about the right to know who owns the building. And I've heard a lot of stories about even next door to where I used to live at, there was a, a vacant home. And as neighbors, we couldn't find out what was going on with it, but it was the grass wasn't cut. And, you know, the city had a slower response because they told us that no they couldn't knew. even access who the owners mm. were. And so that is a consistent problem and it needs to be dealt with. Then the the right to legal counsel in the in the city. So for tenants, um, one of the hugest challenges that we had at PUSH was how do we get people connect to the lawyer, to the attorneys that know how to help them navigate through the court system when they're being brought, you know, into eviction process. And then, you know, another few pieces of the Tenant Bill of Rights includes the right to housing stability, meaning, you know, folks should be able to stay in their in their homes if they are safe and the right to purchase their own home and also a right to rent control. You know, the rents are high, and I think that's what we're seeing right now with the, you know, new Buffalo renaissance. You know, it's a renaissance for some, and it's not a renaissance for others. And as a matter of fact, it's like actually causing a lot more displacement. Where do you think it's going? Where does it stand? The city council has started to have some hearings on this, right? They've started to have some hearings on it. Um, they do have a, a newly formed housing task force, which we're hopeful will actually have um, teeth, You know, meaning that the people that have been, been asked to participate in this have a real voice. Dawn Wells Clyburn is with us. She's the relatively new executive director of Push Buffalo, People United for Sustainable Housing. And it's that sustainable part I want to look at when we come back from the break. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about gas and energy. And I don't mean gasoline. I mean like natural gas that's maybe powering the heat in people's homes and maybe powering their stoves or maybe not. More to come. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. WNED Classical has been conducting interviews of their own on YouTube with the classical music community. Have you ever wondered what goes into the performances you hear on WNED Classical? Head on over to our Buffalo Toronto Public Media YouTube page to see the collection of interviews that we've orchestrated. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. This is Buffalo What's Next where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Don Wells Clyburn is with us, the, again, r- relatively new executive director of PUSH, People United for Sustainable Housing. You are new to the executive director post, but you've been there a while. I've been there nine years as a staff person and 12 years as a member. I came into PUSH as a member. Someone who came there because you had housing issues yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, You know, growing up, we were housing insecure. We moved quite frequently, you know, a single mother. It was me and my brother and all the things that come along with not having housing security. But how I came into PUSH um, was after, you know, I was an adult and I was around for a while and really seeing like a lot of disinvestment in, um, in our communities and decided to like get involved. So by day, you know, I was kind of like, you know, bookkeeper, accountant. In my off time, um, in the evening, I was moonlighting, volunteering, helping out community-based organizations and just really getting involved. And then 
I discovered PUSH, and this was there was a rate hike that was being proposed at the same time that the CEO at the time was getting a huge raise. And so I came in to PUSH and I got, you know, kind of cut my organizing teeth by, you know, training and learning what, what that meant to run a campaign for actual change into in, in the legislation. And, um, you know, I remember being very involved with the Public Service Commission, going to Albany and, you know, so that was where I got my start and um, learning about this work. And, and past his prologue, there is a lot of work underway right now involving gas. You have a campaign called the Out of Gas Campaign. Mm-hmm. What is that looking to do? Yes, it connects to what uh, what I was describing. The Out of Gas campaign is out, out of gas and for justice is the entire name of the campaign. And it's uh, basically a pilot program that allows us to um, have induction stoves as a test to make sure that the indoor air pollutants such as, you know, that comes from natural gas let me, let is me back reduced. Up. Let me interrupt. Yeah. What's an induction stove? <laughs> um, an induction stove is a stove that heats without gas. Um, so it's a plain old electric oven? It's not so plain, but it okay. is it is electric, and it uses, like, really um, high-quality elements to for quick heating for that will replace um, a typical electrical or gas okay. stove. And why is it important for PUSH to have people, if not adopt this, at least test it? Well, it's not, you know, not just important for PUSH. I think it's important for for us to demonstrate that there is a need for this because we already have like such a high rate of uh, asthma and in our, you know, in our communities, especially in Buffalo. Um, we have a lot. Of, there's a study out by um, our partners downstate, We Act, that really has examined, you know, you know, they've done the research to document the issues with the indoor air quality and the pollutants, and it's directly related in a lot of ways, to natural gas being burned in the homes. Your answer surprised me. I thought some of the impetus, or maybe the the majority of the impetus, would be climate-based, would be because natural gas contributes to uh, the greenhouse effect, that kind of thing. Absolutely. I mean, on a larger scale, that is definitely the case. But we, I study Adrian Marie Brown a lot, and we talk about you go out wide and you come in small. The fractal, fractal is just as important as looking at things panoramically. So we have to be working actively at the solution, boots on the ground, what is happening day to day when a person goes in their home and they're, and they're cooking. They need to know what those impacts are to their overall health when they you know, try to compare whether or not they're going to buy groceries or get medicine for their asthma pumps. So I think that's just as important as the conversation we're having at the state and federal levels about the climate law. That is on the books that New York State uh, passed in 2019 because of groups like PUSH, um, who is a founding member of New York Renews, where we have actively sought for implementation of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection uh, Act to be fully funded, which is a which is a pressing thing right now in this very moment. Because the budget is under review right now, has to be in place by April 1st. If they set the program up, but it's not in the budget. It, it doesn't happen. Right. It's not real without the dollars. And we all know that if it don't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. And so we can't have a program. We can't have programs. We can't have a, a law that's on the books without any funding that goes behind it. So the uh, Climate Protection uh, Fund is one of these funds that we're looking at. It has four or five components to it, and they address like a lot of the elements, the problems that we're having in our communities, including um, electrifying, uh, you know, he- heat and community um, community solar programs, um, and the funding of those things are critical for communities, low income uh, communities, and communities of color that don't have the access to all of the things that would make their homes healthier. Governor Hochul's current proposal, I think, has been mischaracterized a little bit, and I bet you would even say demonized a little bit. What is in there? What is she asking for? And why, if you assume that it is good, why is it good? Um, I can't speak to, you know, what her intentions are, but I will say that what we're seeking for is for all of the funding to be in place so that we can, um, you know, have a le- have lead-free homes so that we can have uh, green metal roofs on all of our homes if possible so that we can have solar power and begin to make this conversion um, 
to, you know, come off of gas completely by 2040. And if that doesn't happen and it doesn't start happening now, then we won't meet our goals. And I think that is, you know, the, the driving force, at least from my perspective, with making this climate law a real law, you have to have the, the funding behind it. So the, the ban on new gas stoves in new construction by a certain point down the road um, is really a small piece of this and not even an outright ban, is it, from what you understand? It's not an outright ban. I think that's, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation going on, and it's meant to scare people into thinking someone's coming to take your stove. That is not what's happening. It is, and as you Existing mentioned. Existing stoves are okay. Existing stoves are in place. We will have to well, have I, a You would slow. argue not even okay. But it's yes, not okay. They can stay it's, there. It, it, they can, we have to realize what it is that we're looking at in this moment. It is not a... a, a, a run full force at the wall we are trying to make a transition away from gas with the right with the right timeline that has already been you know vetted out we already understand what we're looking at the crisis the climate crisis is right before our hands we're in buffalo new york and we just had a blizzard and and you know we see the impact of not having um, things in place, what that could look like and how traumatic it is and who is disproportionately impacted by those things, right? Like it is these communities. And so when we look at it for what it is, community, you know, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, that is exactly what it is meant to be. And that's how we need to move forward with that timeline that we will slowly come off of gas and go into something that is going to be more sustainable into the future and healthier in the future. I mentioned that uh, you are relatively new to the executive director mm -hmm. role. How are you different from your predecessor? Um. <laughs> so I'm the third executive director for this organization. Um, you know, our founders, uh, Aaron Bartley. Aaron Bartley, and, who's and now Eric got a Walker. bookstore with waffles or something. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be like him, right? Um, I love waffles. Um, but yeah, yeah me too. Aaron, Aaron Bartley and Eric Walker started this organization. Aaron was a very, I was, I came into the organization um, under Aaron's leadership and Aaron was a very charismatic, you know, a very charismatic leader. And that is typical with, you know, founders of organizations. And that was his that was his mm -hmm. personality and his um, leadership style. Rawa came in at a time in the organization. Your where predecessor was Rawa. Rawa Gramatian. Okay. Gramatian, yes. Rawa came into the organization. We actually started the same year. And I noticed that. The timing that me coming into the year and Rawa coming into the year was just divine because the organization was transitioning in a way where we were we were faced with explosive growth. The organization started in 2005 and 2007. We had our first affordable housing development project. And all of a sudden, things were moving, you know, very fast. We were staffing up and we had to have, you know, infrastructure needed to be built to accommodate the growth that the organization was having. And during that time, when you look at it, you needed someone to come into the organization and grab everything by the reins and carry it forward, because I think the foundation was pretty solid. So I think each, to answer your question, <laughs> each era of, of leadership brought along, um, um, I think the, the leaders within those eras brought along the leadership style that was necessary for that m transformative moment. Where we are right now, um, you know, as I mentioned, I came into the organization at the same time as um, Rawa. Um, however, you know, I was working more so on the infrastructure of the day-to-day -day business administration. We didn't have a finance department that was staffed up. And so I came in and I built that infrastructure. And on the other side of things, you know, Rawa built the infrastructure that was needed for fundraising and for a programmatic. And we worked well together. And now, I feel in a lot of ways we have a solid foundation. We have the framework. We're now a, a, a teenage organization. We're 19. We're out of uh, puberty, so to speak. <laughs> and so now it's just like really learning what adulthood means and really stabilizing all of the work that we've done into the future and then teaching teaching the, the best lessons from that. And I think that that's the, you know, the organization has a different, we're in a different moment, a transformative moment in a lot of ways. And this is what, you know, what I bring to it is just that stabilizing and, and, and expanding out. 
maybe the, the best question to end on is one that I've used in a lot of other programs. Are you an optimist? Because sometimes people who do a lot of work to try and move the ball forward, when the ball doesn't move forward, get a little bit um, disappointed. Others, uh, I've also heard of hospice nurses that love the job because it's fulfilling. Are you an optimist? Huh. I think um, the people closest to me would say I'm a, a glass a glass half uh, half empty kind of gal. I, I like to think that I'm an optimist at uh, at heart, but I probably am more of a realist. Like I, I do like to take a step back and look at the lay of the land and look at everything. And I'm going to always be hopeful because why else would yeah, you be? Why in, would you do? Why, what you why do? be alive yeah. if you're not going to be hopeful about the fact that you can live? And so I think um, in terms of this moment, when you ask me that question, I think, oh, not only do I want to live, not only do I want everyone else to live, but I want us to thrive. And so that if, if that means being optimistic, then yes, I am. Okay. Yep. Hopeful, but maybe not an optimist. Maybe. <laughs> okay. It depends. We'll see. We'll give you that. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on in. Thank you so much, Dave. Dawn Wells Clyburn is the recently appointed executive director at Push Buffalo. That's People United for Sustainable Housing. If you want to get more information about the group, they're online at pushbuffalo.org. Stay with us coming up. Craig Elston of CNC Cuts, a barbershop on Fillmore Avenue. His claim to fame is he sheltered 40 people in a small barbershop during the Christmas blizzard. Jay Moran has storytelling from him coming up next. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Hey, is this thing on? Test, test, one, two. Sounds great. Let's go. The podcast world is overflowing with more than 750,000 podcasts to choose from. But for great local podcasts, you can now go to one place, the new Amplified BTPM Pods app. Here you can discover content produced in Western New York and Southern Ontario, our own backyard. With a wide variety of genres to choose from, there is something for everyone. Listen to the best independently produced podcasts in the region anywhere, anytime. Download the free Amplify BTPM Pods app wherever you get your apps and begin exploring your local podcast community now. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And welcome back to Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. Our guest uh, for the rest of the program, Craig Elston. Craig uh, is the owner-operator of CNC Cuts at uh, Broadway and Fillmore, 707 Fillmore here in Buffalo. Craig, uh, thanks for taking time to, to join us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. You're a busy guy, sometimes uh, 50, 60 customers in a day. So you, you made uh, some time, and your time, of course, is, is money as well. So we do um, we'll certainly appreciate this. Uh, things have uh, changed a little bit for you. I, I want to go back to the Christmas blizzard a little bit here, uh, Craig. Um, we were talking about it before we got on the air. But let's just, just, just talk about what happened. Uh, the blizzard started, I remember very well, Friday morning trying to drive out of here myself, and uh, it was a scary time. Uh, folks turned to your barbershop in your neighborhood uh, for help. They were in trouble, right? Yeah, correct. Um, I just, um, like I said um, a while ago, a lot of interviews, um, an Arabic guy knocked on the door, and he had a lot of frostbite. And Ooh. he was banging like, yo, save my life. Please, 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 please let me in. And um, that's where it started. It started all with him. Just one. Just, just well. It, it was started already with people. one. It started with one outside of the shop. That it was people already was in there. That was clients, but it started with him knocking on the door. That's what caused me to go on a social media platform and let other people know that um, the barber shop is open to the community. Wow! And so people started. They they caught wind of that and they found their way down to your place. Yeah. How many? What was the most you had at any one time? Um. As an estimate, probably up anywhere towards 40 to 50 people. Wow. And you're able to keep everybody comfortable. And I mean, it's better better than being outside when I mean, the wind was like that. Well, what I had, 
some of the socks and T-shirts. I mean, giving people, seeing people take their feet out and change socks and T-shirts and the vending machine food. And the, I'm glad I had a lot of singles on me. So I was, you know, paying for drinks. And I mean, the vending machine lady had a good day that day. She paid me for a, a space in my shop. So she had a real good day when she came in. Um, and that was all me just trying to, you know, make people comfortable. So yeah, just uh, giving them drinks and candy bars and things along those lines just to keep yeah, it going. Whatever we could, man. Yeah. We, it was a, you know, it's a, it's a disaster. So it's a time it's a time where you you scramble and try to make stuff happen. Yeah, yeah no doubt about it, but you know, the and it most certainly was a disaster, but what we're kind of talking about here is the best part of the disaster. Somebody helping out other people because let's be honest, like you said the first man that, that came to your door and a lot of other people they may not have they may not have lived without no, that help i mean like i i know that's a that's a heavy thing to put on you but there 47 people died in that storm i know and the dude from the guy from cnn i'm, I'm sorry i'm saying guy because i don't know his name that's fine um when he was interviewing me on cnn he said it hasn't hit you yet that your guy given to the world to the world and also to buffalo you you save more people than what you know. And to this day, I still have the same thought process um, in my approach. I, I really just, I, I, I'm, I'm not thinking about it like that. So, hold on, so let's go like this then. So in other words, this was just an automatic thought for you. I mean, yeah. you know, it just was the thing to do at that time. Immediately. Because if I'm out there banging in the cold, and I went out there to also help people. Wow. So just being out there, you couldn't survive in that 20 minutes, man. Right. So, yes, without a doubt, I'm opening the door to help people. 100%. And I'll do it again. That's, um, you know, can you talk about what the environment was like then inside? You know, like you said, you, you know, we're... We're getting drinks from the machine. People are pleased to not be out in the cold for sure. What was what was what was the the atmosphere like? It was different. It was different. You got um, maybe five different nationalities. Um, we don't understand each other. Conversations is limited. Everybody's on the phone panicking. Um, the door was kind of snowed in, so we couldn't even, it got to a point where whoever was in was in. Um, you're hearing people saying they family members are stuck in cars. Can I help them? And I felt bad because Bailey and, 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 and Delavan is a long way from Broadway and Fillmore. And my Cadillac sit low to the ground. I can't make it over there. Right. Yeah, I can. Uh... So, could you imagine people on the phone crying to you, asking for you to come get them and help them, and you know if you leave the shop, you may not make it back. Right. That was the the toughest point for me, knowing that I I was out there trying to help people, but it was some people I just knew I couldn't help. Man. So the atmosphere in the shop was different. It was. So this wasn't a party in there. No, man. Some some of the I mean some of the people tried to make light of it during the interviews. But it was a lot of people in there crying. A lot mm. of people was devastated. And a lot of people thought we were going to die in there. Because what if the lights would have went out in the barbershop? It could have. What if the, the heat would have went up? It could have. So thank God that that building was made strong enough to where it didn't affect the building. And I had lights and gas to provide to people and, Thank God that I got stuck to be able to help those people. How long w was the gathering in there? I mean, did some people probably left and, or whatever? As soon as I was able to get some of the snow off the door, people took the chance of going to help some of their family members. But as one would leave, a new person would come. So it was people from the community even coming just to charge their phone. It was people that was stuck in cars that would come just to charge their phone to let people know, hey, this is where I'm at. Can you get somebody with a pickup truck to come get me? So, honestly, maybe a, a hundred people in and out. Wow. But not a hundred at one time. Of course, yeah. 
Yeah, but still, the, the fact that you were there. Now, were you? Did you end up staying there for, for a couple of days? Or were... I was in the barbershop five days. Five straight days. Five straight days. Wow. I miss my daughter's Christmas, Madison, Aaliyah. That broke my heart because I bought them a lot of stuff, and you know I'm not with their mothers, and you know how it is with uh with separate households. Sure. Um, one of the parents is gonna suffer. Um, and I try to give you know both my kids' mothers the proper space so they can live their life. And in the effect of that, I wanted to see both my daughters, and I missed their entire Christmas, their entire holiday. So in the process of me helping other people, I'm, I miss their Christmas, and I can't apologize enough to both of my kids' mothers and my kids, my two girls, for missing their Christmas. That still hit me. You know what I mean? I, I would. I'm not that type of father. Like, I made I made mistakes, yes, as a father, but. I didn't want to miss that, but, you know. Craig, we're going to just take a, a short break, and we'll come back and continue our conversation. Craig Elston from CNC Cuts with us here on Buffalo What's Next. We'll take a quick timeout, come back with more. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. It's the PBS Kids Writers' Contest. Word up! Come on! We're looking for amazing stories. They say everything. Everyone has a story to tell. From writers in kindergarten through third grade. It's going to be tiger-tastic. Remember, it's for kids only. I got a story I want to tell. Me too. Winners in your area will be selected from a panel of judges. Yeah. I'm so excited I can't think. Visit WNED.org slash writers contest for more information. Hi, it's Robin Young from NPR's Midday News Magazine Here and Now. We'll bring you all the news that happens between the morning headlines and the afternoon wrap-up, plus conversations with authors and artists, stories that affect you, maybe a story about you. So please join us for NPR's Midday News Magazine Here and Now. Listen to Here and Now, weekdays at 1 p.m. This is Buffalo What's Next where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And we're back on Buffalo What's Next with Craig Elston at CNC Cuts at 707 Fillmore. And that's how you can find Craig, as a matter of fact, if you're going to Instagram, Craig Elston 707 at Instagram, right? And uh, we're, are we live on Facebook right yeah, now? Yeah, we're live on Facebook right now. On your Facebook page? Correct. What is that? What's that's, that? That's uh, Craig the Barber and also my name, Craig Elston. You can uh, tune in and see what life is like here inside the, the WBFO studios with us right now. Hey, uh, Craig, I appreciate you sharing your stories. And, and you know, uh, so you didn't get home for five days. Correct. Being in the, in the store there. I, I'm just curious about you. And we're talking about your, your daughters going into the break and such. How about for you? You know, you know and we've heard a little bit about this from other folks as well. You know, the, the burden, the mental burden on people from these types of situations. You were in there for five days trying to help people. Like you told me, some people you, you couldn't help. You couldn't get back to your daughters for, for Christmas. How are you doing? How are you doing since this all happened? Uh, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, a lot of attention. And it comes to the point where I'm just trying to get my thoughts together as far as really being in a different light. Um, it's like overnight stardom. One day I'm just a you know average shop owner that a lot of people don't know to now I got people in France, Australia, Canada, um, England. <laughs> the list goes on. I mean, literally across the world, people know who I am. Um, that's different. And so on the outside looking in, some people are saying, wow, that's cool. That's got to be the coolest existence that there can be, but that's right. not how it is. No, it's not. Um, you got a lot of people that um, reach out. Um, that's why I got two phones now, because one of them don't stop ringing. Hmm. The, I, the, the messages don't stop. Uh, maybe over 600 messages on Facebook on each one of them, maybe 500 messages on Instagram. 
Um, just maybe a coming. thousand on my on my business page. Yeah, man, it's uh like literally. I have to understand that I'm famous now, and that's different. It's some people like, yeah, man, I want to be well known, but then when you when you get there, it's really not what you think it is. So you, I mean, just to to go over it a little bit, not to necessarily take you through the the, the trauma of remembering, but I, you were on the BBC, New York Times, CNN, People Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal, yeah. Uh, NBC, Good Morning America, um, CBC, uh, Australia, World News, uh, France, World News, uh, London. Um, they all found you. They all found me, yeah. Wow. I, it's, it, is, it is kind of um, mind-blowing to start thinking about that level of attention from all around, around the world. And then having to be the one who has to answer the phone when that comes comes to pass. Correct. What about um, for your business? You've got folks working in your shop. How many barbers in your shop? It's it's five barbers, including me, and five hairstylists. Okay. Has it helped them out a little bit? Have they seen increased business? Have yes, they been yeah. able to benefit from the, yeah. all this chaos? Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of foot traffic is coming to the shop. You still have your slow days. Because of due to the weather, but I think the real difference will be during the summer because of all the worldwide attention the barbershop get. You may get people that's flying in. I've had celebrities reach out to me. Yeah. You know, they don't want me to disclose. Sure. You know what I mean? But they're talking about coming to your shop. Yeah, but it's some big celebrities that want to come down to the shop and get a haircut by me. So um, I've had conversations with them on the phone, and they say, hey, you know, during your interviews, just please don't let people know that I'm coming at this time. I don't want the shop to be chaotic. Do you promise to put it on Instagram when it's done? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely putting <laughs> okay. it on. I, I definitely want to, you know, get some pictures and put it I'm on. I'm following you now, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to put it on and uh, do that. But, um, you know, for disclosure purposes, I, you know, I'm not going to break that and let people know who's going to be coming. Yeah, and that does highlight what it's like for a barber. We were talking about this a little bit before you go on the air. You're cutting hair. You've got to make people look nice. But there's another element to what you bring to your customers and what your customers kind of come to rely on you for? Um, you kind of a counselor. Um, you're a person that's listening to their problems. You have to be able to give them a good service and also give them good answers. So a lot of times you want to give out good advice. You want to be able to come to your barber, and even if you wrong, your barber tell you, like, hey, you made a mistake. You got to do better. And um, I try to be that voice of reason to the community when people come in and they ask me questions. And, you know, like I said, man, it's a lot of people in the shop that I want to see them blossom. Um, you know, just to name some of the people yeah, please. that uh, work in the shop, um, we got Carl, um, you know what I mean? His name is Carl Love on Facebook. He's a, a great barber, a long time, long time barber, uh, a, a neighborhood. He's a neighborhood favorite. A lot of people in the neighbor, neighborhood know him. His name is Carl. Um, we got Rock. Rock has been with the shop. You know what I mean? Rock is a good barber. Um, we have a Carl daughter, Anila. She does uh, install wigs. She's very good. We have Mariah. She braids little kids' hair. Hmm. Um, we have Kareem. Kareem is extremely hungry. He's very eager. He's you know trying to take his life in the right direction. Does he remind you of you a little yeah, bit? Yeah, he's like a the little version of me. Yeah. Um, then we have Diamond. Um, she may be the best barber in the shop. Wow. Um, Diamond is extremely skilled. She's very professional. Um, she's so professional. She even got a cape with an apron and uh, the barber jacket with the same picture on it. So she's extremely professional. Um, we got Caprice. She's a licensed comatologist. Uh, she she does a number of things. She's very very skilled, very very talented. We have Sarah. Um, Sarah is very skilled, very talented. She's also a licensed comatologist. And then the last person is uh, Ariana. She does lashes and she does uh, locks, and she's very skilled at lashes. So um, it's a well-rounded shop, and you know I want all of those people to be successful. And you're also you say you're always looking for more. Always looking for more. Um, you can never stop building. You can never stop branding. Um, I really just want uh, my family 
because I consider them family to grow and to blossom in their own individual way. And I want people to come down to the barbershop and support the movement that we as a team, not just me, right? but we as a team is trying to create. And you, I mean, well, you you come from a basketball background. You played uh, high school ball, junior college ball, had a nice career both at Riverside and uh, uh, Jamestown Community College as well. So you have that uh, sense about teamwork. That's yeah. something you try to imbibe in other folks. I mean, I learned a lot with that in uh, playing basketball. That you're only as strong as the the weakest person on the team. So even if you're the star player, as a star player, your job is to make the 12th man on the team better. So with me being a leader, um, I wouldn't be one if I didn't try to make people around me better. And sometimes I distance myself because I focus so hard in becoming better that I may miss things. And to you know, to the, to those people that is suffering with me really trying to brand my business and grow, I apologize. And and the two people that's really suffering the most is my daughters. Aaliyah Elston and Madison Elston. I, 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 if y'all listening, Daddy, love y'all. I, I love y'all more than anything. I love y'all more than I love myself, and I, I, I badly want to be successful so their lives could be easier. You know, and then that kind of uh, gets into something that we were talking about: the downside of all this fame that you've uh, you were talking about a little bit more off there than we've gotten into uh, on air, and. People are coming to you for more than just advice sometimes and more than just a haircut. Correct. And you've got to you, you you've got to really walk a line here. Let's talk about that because it really goes to the heart of a philosophy that I think people would find fascinating. Yeah. Um, like I said, I don't I don't I won't give you nothing, but I'll feed you. Which means that I'll feed you knowledge. I'll feed you the things that you need. But I can't give you nothing because nothing was given to me. You got to put the, you got to put the work in and you got to want to be successful. And just like I opened up the barbershop to the community and life after that, I'll do it again because I want to help people. I want to be a service to the community. And part of that is more than haircuts. A barber isn't just a barber. You know, we're everything to the community. And that was a chance for me to illustrate what a barber really is to his community in opening the doors up to the community and saving lives. And all this worldwide attention is is cool, but I didn't do it for that. And I'm going to go on public uh, record saying it every chance I get I only did it to help but at the same time two years ago you opened those doors on Fillmore Avenue Broadway and Fillmore everybody knows about Broadway and Fillmore it's not what it once was that's for sure you decided to set up shop right there in the heart of that neighborhood a bad one at that and it's working out so far yes it's, it's working out not without its issues yes it's, it has its ups and downs you know men have egos and sometimes egos get the best of us. And sometimes we make poor decisions. But we have to, as men, put our egos to the side. Sometimes pride can be your biggest downfall. You can be so prideful that you put that in the way of success. What are your hopes for that neighborhood? I mean, it's uh, like you said, there's the Broadway market there right now, but and there's your shop at 707 Fillmore. What are your hopes for that neighborhood? What what does it need? It's a building right across the street. And I would love to see somebody donate some money into that building. That's their old M&T Bank building. Correct. And I would love to see somebody open that up and make something of that. I would love to see more food spots around that neighborhood. I would love to see more stores open in that neighborhood. I would love for us to have a bigger picture than just drug dealers and people that's using drugs in that neighborhood. I would love to be... A community leader of that neighborhood to make things better in that area so that we don't get painted as a bad neighborhood. We get painted as, hey, I want to be on Broadway and Fillmore. And it sounds like people want to be in your shop. They want to be in the shop, but that's not necessarily Broadway and Fillmore. 
what do you think could be done? What are I mean, are there any small things that you think could could, could help the situation, or is it, or is it just one of those multi pronged problems that you know has a lot going on? Like you said, drugs, I mean, crime. I've been in contact with the mayor's office, the the governor, and Mark Polenkart. Uh, you know, get some grants going. Get some funding going to, for the barbershop. That way, I could be a center stone and help the community better. And the barbershop could be a place where more than anything we can provide for the community. Hey, Craig Elston, uh, I really appreciate your time. Thanks again. I know, like you said, your yeah. the uh, the attention from uh, what you guys did at the Christmas blizzard just getting a little overwhelming. But for I think everybody here in the city, thanks for what you did. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Craig Elston is the owner-operator of CNC Cuts at Fillmore, or Broadway and Fillmore, that's 707 Fillmore, and he is our guest here on Buffalo What's Next. This is WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown.